Good morning, everyone. This is Rebecca Smith Aldridge, the Executive Director of the Mid Hudson Library System, and we thank you for joining us today for our Trustees Essentials Workshop. Uh, this is our first year doing online trustee workshops thanks to COVID. Uh, sometimes there's a silver lining and challenges that we face in life, and uh, your ability to attend today might have hinged on it being offered online. So we hope this format works for you. Uh, today uh, we have uh, a streamlined version of our Trustee Essentials Workshop for you, um, and we're going to uh, let you know what to expect here as we get through uh, the 90-minute workshop today. Uh, to kick things off, you know, normally when we're in the room together, we get to meet everyone and find out how long you've been on the board. And so we're just asking everyone to use the chat box to share your name and your library and how long you've served on the board. Uh, because in the 20 years we've been doing these workshops here at Mid-Hudson, we found that it doesn't quite matter the length of time you've been on the board. You usually will learn something at this Trustee Essentials a webinar or formerly workshop and you know we've had people who have been on the board for 20 years come to this workshop and say oh I wish I came sooner that was so helpful it would have made my life a lot easier had I known this stuff sooner uh, in the time I've been on the board we've also had people who weren't yet on their local library board they were doing research and considering whether or not the board was a good fit for their volunteer experience and they still chose to serve on their library board so we take that as a sign of success um, that what they heard and what they saw was uh, doable and manageable for them and, and fit their needs for what they're looking for for their community service uh, and we hope that you're feeling the same uh, through your experience with your local library board. So uh, today what we're going to be doing is covering the very basics of uh, trustee service and local library boards in New York State and New York State is uh, kind of particular and in, in a number of ways and we're going to try to demystify a couple of things for you today. So we're going to start by going through the, the library network in New York State and help you understand the context that your library uh, works within because it is a pretty extensive network and libraries in New York work very well together uh, and that obviously takes some thought and effort so we're going to decode that for you and make it very clear who's in charge of libraries in New York State uh, because I think that's an important uh, chain of command line to understand so that uh, when you're seeing messages come through or you've got uh, issues with your library that it's really clear where to go to get help uh, and really where the buck stops when it comes to issues with libraries here in our state. Then we'll talk about roles and responsibilities, the kind of nitty gritty stuff that you'll be doing as a library trustee and probably are already doing if you're on the board uh, currently. So we'll just run through the relationship with the library director, what you're expected to do, and then we'll talk at the end here about board meetings, since that's where you spend the most of your time uh, in your service to your library is in meetings. We wanna make sure you've got the basics of board meetings in New York State when it comes to open meetings law and how that impacts how you do business and just share some best practices for uh, having board meetings go smoothly and be a good use of everybody's time. Now, normally we'd be in the room with you and you'd be uh, handed or offered uh, a print copy of the Handbook for Library Trustees of New York State. Uh, this is sometimes called the Trustee Bible because it's literally the only publication that's available uh, to explain the, the role of the trustee in New York's libraries. So uh, we still want to offer this to you if you would like a print copy. It is available online for free. Uh, as you saw, Kirsten sent you a link to that before today's webinar. But if you're one of those people who likes print and you like print copies of things, uh, we'll make sure to get you uh, that print copy. So all you need to do is use this workshop code and email Joan at our business office. Her email is right there for you, jkay at midhudson.org, and she'll put a copy of that in the delivery to your local library for you to pick up there. So let's dive in. Uh, Casey's going to manage questions for us. We'll stop at the end of each section to see what questions have come in. So don't feel like you have to hold off until the, we get to the question section. You can pop your questions in at any time and we'll be sure to get to them all. If we run out of time at the end of the session, we will follow up with you individually to make sure you get the answers that you need. One of the most important things to us here today is that you understand that Casey and I are here to help you. It's literally our job to help you. So never apologize for reaching out. If you have questions, even if it's something 
you know got covered in the webinar and you should have understood it. Uh, we have new trustees literally every day. There is over 600 member library trustees in the Mid-Hudson Library System, so there's always someone new, and we're always happy to help you uh, decode uh, the, ro the role of the library trustee. So never hesitate to reach out. We're happy to help. So let's dive into the library network in New York State, because I've been at the Mid-Hudson Library System for 21 years now, and it only took me like the first 12 years to figure out the library network in New York State. So I'm going to save you a lot of time. So this is the first time we're going to be pointing to the packet that you were sent. Uh, Kirsten also sent you, along with a link to the Handbook for Library Trustees, a handout packet for today's workshop. And what we've done is, is crafted a, a handout packet for your reference. It has many of the uh, slides that you'll see in here, sometimes in more detail. So I just want to point that out before we dive in here to make sure that you don't feel like you have to write down absolutely everything you're hearing this morning and make sure you know that you will get a copy of the slide deck as well for reference if that's helpful to you. Uh, so we just uh, thought we'd take pity on your hands as you try to take notes during the session today. So you'll see right on page one, this is should look exactly like what you see on page one of that handout packet that we gave you. And uh, you can tell we, we do webinars right here at Mid-Hudson by starting off with a super exciting flow chart of the library network in New York State. That was a complete joke. It's not exciting. Um, but it is, uh, I think, revealing in that it it paints the picture of what it's like uh, in New York State for libraries. We are not general nonprofits. We don't fall under the attorney general like a regular nonprofit does. We're part of the educational landscape of New York State. We're actually organized within the state education department. And for any of you that are a part of the educational community uh, or are just familiar with the New York State budget and how things work in New York, you know this is the largest area of state government. It's the largest area of the state budget. It's in an enormous department and libraries are a very very small part of it in in let's say in perspective of how large everything else is so when you take a look at how the education uh, infrastructure of New York State works, at the very top is what's called the Board of Regents, which is an oversight board that makes policy and funding recommendations. They don't control money, but they make recommendations. But they are the ultimate authority when it comes to educational institutions in New York State. And they empower the education commissioner to write regulation that oversees educational institutions, including libraries. But the actual staff that work on a daily basis with libraries, you don't really start to see that in that flow chart until you're right in the middle there where you see the Office of Cultural Education. And that's the first place you're going to find mention of libraries in state government. The Office of Cultural Education oversees four areas of work. You can see there public broadcasting, the archives, the museum, and the New York State Library. You may be familiar with the New York State Library as a physical location on Madison Avenue in Albany. It's a research library. You can physically go there uh, and access resources that are very, very interesting interesting, but more germane to what we're talking about today is what's called the Division of Library Development. And this is your first acronym today, which is DLD. I think we put in your packet a list of acronyms at the very end because library people love acronyms. And one of the, I think, challenges for new trustees is people use acronyms without explaining them when you are at a board meeting. So you've got a little cheat sheet now at the end of your handout packet to keep up with all those acronyms. But one of my goals today is to not use an acronym without defining it for you. So DLD is something that you might hear about. You might hear your director talk about, oh, DLD said this, or we have to report this to DLD. That is the bureaucratic agency that is the, you know, where the rubber hits the rolls between the state and libraries. Now, the Division of Library Development, they oversee what's called library systems, and that's what the Mid-Hudson Library System is in this flowchart. We're a public library system, which is actually pretty unique in the United States. Uh, a public library system in New York State, there's three different kinds of systems themselves. You can see there, there's ones devoted to public libraries like Mid-Hudson, there's school library systems, and then if you think about all the other types of libraries, they fall under reference and research library resource systems. So that encompasses academic libraries, hospital libraries, law libraries, even historical societies sometimes fall under what they call the three R's. That's the one on the left, the reference and research library resource systems. But public library systems completely devoted to public libraries. There's three different kinds of public library systems. So you can see it doesn't even have all the detail in this flow chart. But here in your system, your region, you're part of the Mid-Hudson Library System, which is called a cooperative library system, which 
which in our opinion is the best kind uh, because it's it's really effective. Uh, we are a cooperative system with 66 libraries that all choose to cooperate together to make their money go further and to make sure their patrons have more access to stuff than they would otherwise. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. And then your library works with our system to both comply with state regulation to make sure that you're in good standing with New York State and eligible to receive tax dollars. But really, we have no authority over you. It's good to know that. Uh, we do act as the agent of the state sometimes. We'll uh, carry forth a grant program or an aid program from the state on behalf of libraries in our region. If there is an investigation from a complaint from a library, we do manage that. But for a day-to-day -day basis, and, and please test what I'm about to say with your directors, we position ourselves as your partners. We're there to help facilitate a quality library service for your community uh, in a way that's economical for your your community and we spend most of our time facilitating cooperation amongst our libraries to the benefit of your public and we'll explain that a little more uh, in just a minute. So your relationship with the state will probably be minimal over the time that you're on the board unless there's some catastrophic issue which hopefully does not happen at your, your particular library but for the most part the contact is with our system the Mid-Hudson Library System uh, with the exception perhaps of uh, filing your annual report to the state uh, which you're required to do in the first quarter of each year and your director does not look forward to that time of year it's stressful for them they have to collate a lot of data uh, both uh, usage data and financial data to get that up to the state um, but it's critical that you help them and support them in doing that report uh, because it, it's very much tied to funding that comes through the state to libraries in our region so we pride ourselves on our libraries doing a great job on that you'll be asked to uh, take a look at it verify the information does it match with the other reports that you've seen uh, and it will also uh, ask you to sign off on what's called the minimum standards for public libraries in New York State, which we're going to uh, review with you briefly here today. Now, financially, you do receive a bit of cash from the state. You get something, and here's your next acronym, called Local Library Services Aid, or LLSA, Local Library Services Aid. And by formula, it's 31 cents per capita or $1,500, whichever is more. So as you realize how much money that is in your budget and your over overall revenue uh, projections, it's not a huge chunk of money. The majority of your operating aid comes from your local tax base, and that is as it should be. Uh, the majority of state money comes into the system's budget and is then spent collectively on your behalf. And we'll talk a bit more about how that leveraging really goes further than it might if it was handed off to each individual library. Uh, but the regulation that oversees libraries that requires you to meet minimum standards is what is tied to allowing you to receive local tax dollars so that what might make up 80 90 percent of your operating budget uh, which is hopefully voted on by the public and decided on by your local taxpayers you're only legally allowed to receive that money if you meet minimum standards so there are currently 11 minimum standards these are in effect currently, and when you see your annual report to the state documentation in the first quarter of next year, this is what you're uh, judged on and are, are verifying that yes, you meet these standards. Most of them are very easy for your library to meet. They're things that have been in place for a very long time. Uh, you might be asked to you know, double check your bylaws to make sure they're up to date, or uh, during your tenure, you might uh, see your long range plan uh, expire and need to create a new one. And we'll talk a bit about that today of how to go about that. But you can see here very basic things, like we said, bylaws, which outline the governance structure of your library, a long-range plan of service, uh, it could be three or five years, it's not prescribed how long it is, uh, your annual report to the community, which lets the community know how you've spent the money on their behalf and what outcomes you've achieved and the financial status of your library, uh, policies, which we'll talk more about today, uh, presenting a board-approved budget to the community. If you have a public vote, you've already gotten that taken care of. Uh, if you don't have a public vote, or you don't have one every single year, you just need to make sure your budget is publicly accessible on the library's website. Number six is to evaluate the effectiveness of your library services on behalf of the, the whole community, not just ever, the people who come through the doors or the website of your library to access services, but making sure the services reflect the needs of the whole community. Uh, and there's definitely a methodology for how, how to go about doing that. Your director is usually in the lead on that one. And while it's not required annually, you do want to make sure it happens regularly uh, to make sure that you're investing the resources wisely on behalf of those you represent on the board. 
Number seven is a minimum number of hours, and that number of hours is based on the size of your chartered service population. And that's the first time we're using the word charter today. Uh, when we mentioned before that your, your library falls under the governance structure of the education department, they actually issued the legal uh, documentation that brought your library into legal existence. That particular document is called your library's charter. Your library's charter document or charter file will explain your service area, how many trustees you need to have, and may have some other odds and ends in it, but those are the two main things that it describes. So if you're not sure what your technical service area is. It is defined in the charter document. Uh, it's also important to note that the number of trustees is prescribed in the charter document and your bylaws cannot conflict with that. The charter holds more weight than the bylaws do. But your minimum number of hours is based on that chartered service population and so you'll see when you take a look at the minimum number of hours it's broken out. Uh, if you have less people to serve you have to be open less number of hours and this is pretty relevant right now as many libraries have made major adjustments to their hours because of COVID and their work to keep library workers and the public safe. Um, but you do have a minimum number of hours you need to be opened in order to maintain what's called your registration. And that's the document that couples with your charter to demonstrate that your library is in good standing in the eyes of New York State. So the registration is what can be pulled by New York State if you're not complying with the minimum standards. Uh, and if you did not have good registration, your registration was no longer in effect, you could no longer receive local, county, or state tax money. So you can see pretty quickly how that's a major problem. So complying with these uh, 11 minimum standards, which are not too onerous, you, know, you might as well go ahead and do it because it's a, it's a really a big payoff uh, when you think about it. Uh, number eight, a facility that meets community needs, and that is a very uh, open statement, open to interpretation, shall we say, but very helpful information on the state's website for how to meet community needs. And we'll talk a little more about that today as well. Equipment and connections, uh, that looks different as uh, technology iterates, but uh, the one thing that's not changing is the need for really robust broadband connections. Uh, we're seeing that even more so. Uh, these days with COVID and understanding how reliant families are for remote learning and connectivity to do that remote learning, it's never been more important that we have really solid Wi-Fi connections for our libraries and, and think differently about equipment that maybe it's not centralized in our buildings, but perhaps lendable to families who need that, that type of connectivity assistance. Number 10, very straightforward, printed info about the library. Hours open, phone number, how you get a card, very basic information. And number 11, a paid director. So you must have a paid director. You can't have a volunteer director. It must be paid director with the appropriate education level. And that again is tied to your chartered service area. So if you're above a certain number of population, your director uh, may need to have a master's in library science or information science, depending on the program they were in. But the program must be accredited by the American Library Association. So there's detailed information about minimum standards on the State Library's website. Uh, there's also workshops we've done here at Mid-Hudson that have been recorded uh, that you'll be interested in, uh, primarily because the standards are about to evolve. Uh, they're changing. So while you're reporting on the 11 you see here in the report you'll file in the first quarter of 2021, on January 1st of 2021, the standards are changing. They're growing a bit. They've added a couple. Uh, they've enhanced a few that you see here. And you'll have all year of 2021 to figure those out, come into compliance, and you'll want to be in a good spot by the first quarter of 2022 to say, yes, we're in compliance with the new standards. So if that's something you haven't learned uh, much about. We've got them in your packet for you so you can see them. Uh, so starting on page two, you've got the current standards laid out for you. And then you can see on page five is the comparison of the current standards and the new standards, which go into effect on January 1st. You'll notice a, a recurring phrase, uh, which is community-based planning. And that is a very key change in the new standards, that the state no longer wants to see long-range plans of services that have been the brainchild of an insular group of people at the library. They wanna see evidence that you've gotten out into the community. Uh, you've been doing assessment work to talk to people, maybe talk 
talking to uh, key leaders in the community of uh, local government, of agencies, uh, school leaders, families, all types of people to make sure you have a very good sense of what's going on, what challenges are being faced by your community members and what opportunities lie ahead uh, to help craft library services that are relevant and responsive. And then you'll notice many of the other standards tie back to a community-based, community input-based long-range plan to make sure that we're developing services, programs, facilities, uh, technology expenditures that are all moving towards the same goal of meeting the needs of our community. So it's a very holistic approach uh, in the new version of the standards. So you might wonder how do other libraries do some of these things and that's one of the cool things about being a member library in the Mid-Hudson Library System uh, is that we've got libraries that are in all different stages of evolution, all different shapes and size libraries and they're all willing to share their best practices. So you'll often see items on our uh, calendar that Casey puts together. Right now he's uh, in the midst of doing a reimagining library services in the face of COVID-19 webinar series. And that's really, you know, highlighting what's going well for libraries in our system and helping other libraries who might want to replicate some of that um, do so. So we're, we're really focused on sharing best practices in our system. And that's much thanks to the generosity of our member libraries who share their knowledge and their experience uh, so that others can learn from that. So that's one of the cool things about Mid-Hudson. There's many cool things about Mid-Hudson. We are uh, one of the largest library systems in the state. We actually have the most member libraries of any system outside of the New York City region. Uh, we cover Columbia, Dutchess, Green, Putnam, and most of Ulster County. Uh, you'll notice the orange line on the map there cuts off part of Ulster County. There's four libraries in the southwest corner there of Ulster who are part of what our sister library system called the Ramapo Catskill Library System. Uh, in the 1950s, they chose which drive they wanted to make uh, to Middletown or to Poughkeepsie and they chose Middletown. So uh, that we're not taking it personally, um, but it is a little awkward that we don't have all of Ulster County when we talk about our service area. Now the Mid-Hudson Library System is also chartered by New York State. We're what they call a quasi-state government entity, which puts us in a really strange position, sometimes legally. Um, but at the end of the day, we are an, an organization that's here to serve your library. And we're governed by people from the field. We have a 15-member governing board. Um, the board is elected by you, our member library trustees. In fact, we've got our annual membership meeting coming up next Friday where we'll elect uh, three new members to our board uh, that have been nominated from their counties. The, the library associations of each county chose their representative on our board. So very close relationship between our board and your county. If you're not familiar with our board or who represents your county, you can visit midhudson.org, go to the About Midhudson section and read all about our board. They're very transparent and they may ask to come to one of your board meetings. Don't be surprised if they hop on the line for an online meeting or come to your library once you resume in-person meetings. They're very interested to hear what's going on at your library to make sure they represent your needs well at the system level. So at Mid-Hudson, we mentioned we're a quasi-state organization, which does mean uh, we get state funding. 75% of our state funding comes from New York State. Of course, it used to be a much higher percentage. They used to completely cover our operational costs. But over time, they have not invested in libraries at a rate that has kept up with inflation, uh, nor evolution in what libraries are all about these days. So over time, we've worked collaboratively with our directors association and our full member library library stakeholder group to really make sure we're very clear on what your library needs from Mid-Hudson, that we cleanly communicate, well, okay, this is how much it's going to cost and where the money is going to come from to make that all happen. So in, I'd say around 2008, 2009, our funding model evolved and our member libraries now invest in the system operations as well to make sure they have a modern uh, integrated library system software so you can manage circulation and that we have a delivery service that can keep up with everything uh, that your patrons are requesting and that we have professional staff uh, that are available to you when you need technical assistance uh, and library development assistance. So right now that is the current uh, funding structure of New York. As you may be aware, New York State has uh, greatly cut funding for every agency uh, that they fund. Uh, we've lost about 22.6 percent of our funding for the current fiscal year, which has obviously presented some challenges. Uh, but again, that's our board's responsibility to help figure that 
that out. And we are well on our way to combating that cut as in a, as a healthy way as we can uh, in light of this. But all of it's done with very good communication to uh, our member libraries. Your director participates in what's called the Directors Association, uh, which is an informal group that gets together regularly, however, to shape policy and to advise uh, system services. So uh, when you're a cooperative library system, it really is all about communication. And we spend a lot of time making sure our lines of communication are open uh, so that everyone gets heard and we make sure we're making the best possible choices on everyone's behalf. On page seven, you'll see there that map is there, and you'll also see a list of all of our member libraries. Uh, we're very proud of our libraries. They do an awesome job, and uh, I think they're well-respected throughout the state for the good work they do on behalf of their communities. So not that we're biased, but we think uh, you're pretty lucky to be in the Mid-Hudson Library System because our libraries work very well together. We're the only system in the entire state where all libraries share all items with all patrons, uh, which really broadens what your patrons are able to get. You're not just locked into the items in your physical building, you have access to close to 3 million items that are in 70 buildings throughout this 3,000 square mile region. Um, so you can see right away, just that alone uh, amplifies what you're able to offer your community and doing so in an economical as possible way. The Division of Library Development has actually estimated that for every dollar that's invested from the state into the library system, we are able to produce approximately $7 worth of services for your community. So by working together, we go much further than we would if each library was an island unto itself trying to figure out all of this stuff. Um, so we literally save our libraries millions of dollars every year. Uh, the delivery system alone saves close to $4 million. So uh, you can only imagine the fact that there's 14 different service areas from our system. Each one is a financial savings to your library. Uh, it's a pretty good deal when you, when you take a look at how much you contribute financially and what your community is getting back for it. Uh, and if that's something you're you're concerned about you can always reach out we're happy to explain uh, what we're doing and answer any questions you may have we divide our services into two main areas. Uh, we can describe them as resource sharing, uh, which is making sure that uh, resources are accessible to your patrons. Uh, I think in public library world, we believe that uh, access to information is absolutely critical to function well in this world. Um, so making sure physical items can get where they need to go in an economical way. Uh, having a software system, which is called Sierra, that manages front desk operations at your library and cataloging materials so they're findable. Providing an online interface so people can search for items across all 70 buildings and it actually facilitates borrowing and wait, wait lists for those things um, to, to modernize uh, public service in the Hudson Valley. And we also coordinate e-resources which has obviously become a huge deal this year with uh, the stay-at-home orders and people wanting to social distance. So we negotiate contracts that make uh, more e-resources affordable and leverage state dollars that come in specifically for reference services uh, to create an e resource suite that's accessible to all residents of the Hudson Valley, not just the wealthier libraries in the region. The other half of what we do is library development, and you're participating in that right now. Uh, so a trustee education series, a technical assistance for your board. Sometimes you'll uh, see me at your board meetings. Sometimes your board president or director invites me in to help with an issue you might be facing. Maybe it's to pass a referendum, or Casey comes in to help you with long range planning. Uh, there's all sorts of challenges or opportunities your board might be faced with that we can help you learn from how other libraries have been successful in that. Uh, we also do uh, technology support. We are uh, leaders in advocacy and awareness work in our region and our state. And Casey also works with special populations that are mandated to be, uh, uh, I think, invested in from the state level to make sure if you have a patron with special needs, uh, there are resources that are leveraged at the state level for them to access uh, that sometimes we can help mediate. Um, so I'm not going to say that we do absolutely everything for your library that you could want. We're very careful. We have limited resources and we really fine tune them every year to make sure what we invest our time and energy in is paying off at the other end for your library to make sure your library is stronger, more viable, and more visible in your community. Um, so we have a planning cycle coming up next year. You'll be invited to participate in that. Um, so that'll be something fun uh, for us all to work on, to reimagine library services, not just in the, the wake of COVID, but what it will look like in the next few years, which is always fun to think about. 
So we're going to talk about types of libraries and explain that to you, and then we'll stop for questions. So again, feel free to pop questions in the box if that's helpful uh, to you now. You don't have to wait uh, to the uh, question and answer period to get your question in the queue. So I'm going to first get you on the page in your packet that's helpful here, which is uh, page 8. Uh, the types of libraries chart from the state library is explained here. And this is very interesting, right? Because looking at one library uh, down the road from you, you might not be able to tell. It's technically a different type of public library legally and from a governance standpoint. So knowing what type of library you are is very important um, because you'll find that different types of libraries fall under different laws. And so, of course, you'll want to make sure you're following the correct laws and understand financing options should you be confronted with a large uh, capital project in the future of the library. So the majority of libraries in New York State are association libraries, which you see listed there first on the left. And in Mid-Hudson, over half of our libraries are association libraries. This is the oldest type of library in New York State. Often they were formed before uh, the State Education Department took over running libraries, which oh, those libraries have very interesting charter files. We actually have the first and second oldest libraries in the state in the Mid-Hudson Library System. Uh, they are the Star Library in Rhinebeck is the oldest, and the uh, Grinnell Library in Wappingers Falls is the second oldest. So we have a long tradition of libraries uh, in our region, which is pretty cool. Um, but the older libraries that are association libraries, and you'll find still today, the you know, smaller libraries are often association libraries. You have what's called a self-perpetuating board, uh, which means no public election. It means someone probably uh, found you or you found them and you realized it was a good fit for you to serve on the board and you got voted in by your peers on the board. Um, so somewhat informal uh, for the most part. Your funding structure can vary. And what I mean by that is that when your library was formed, the state did not provide a clear mechanism for how your operations would be funded. So for many years, association libraries contracted with municipalities for service, but over time we've helped to evolve as many association libraries as possible to a voter-directed funding model using what's called a municipal ballot vote, uh, which uses town boundaries, uh, the residents of the town boundaries, to vote on how much they will tax themselves for library services. That's also called a 414 or 414 vote, uh, which you might hear about. Those votes often don't happen every year because of a petition process to get you on the ballot, which is a little onerous, and your trustees who are more experienced will definitely agree with me about it being onerous, um, but it is an incredible incredibly valuable exercise to get on the ballot and to have voter approved funding because once you have that funding it cannot be cut by the municipality. It could only be reduced if the library board itself put forth a referendum asking to lower the amount. So it stabilizes your funding and it creates a sustainable funding pattern uh, that allows you to go back to the voters and again ask for increases as necessary and the voters themselves get to decide how much to tax themselves for library services. Uh, it is is the absolute only way to you know really I think stabilize your library for the future at this point. You can also be on the school ballot uh, if your library serves the whole school or you have an arrangement with another library that's in the same school district. That's called a 259 or school district ballot vote um, where you can also ask the residents of the school district to how much to tax themselves to support your library. That is very rarely used in our system because there's so much overlap of libraries within the boundaries of school districts. The 414 path is much more common. You do not fall under civil service, uh, but you also don't have the uh, inherent right to go to the, the voters if you need a, a capital bond for, for a, a capital project like a building renovation or expansion. That's a huge drawback to being an association library. Uh, we've had several association libraries do massive building projects, uh, most recently up in Columbia County. Uh, Kinderhook and Claverack Library both opened new facilities in the past two years. They did traditional uh, capital campaigns, raising money from major donors, grant writing, fundraising events, it took a very long time. Uh, so having the right to go to the voters to bond is a, a huge benefit uh, and obviously comes with great responsibility as well. So you'll notice the other three types of libraries are under the mantle of technically public libraries because they fall in more to the public side of law uh, and they are held to a higher standard in many areas, particularly in the area of finance, than the association libraries are. And that's because they, they have a higher standard, I think, of uh, both governance and uh, funding ability uh, under those models. So 
A municipal public library, very rare. Only eight of our 66 libraries are municipal libraries uh, here in the Mid-Hudson Library System. The board is a political appointment. So you are appointed by the municipality. Um, so elected officials are appointing the library board. And depending on what town you're in or what village you're in, um, that can be a, a smooth process or a contentious one. And that can change from administration to administration. So you can see uh, that might be a challenge sometimes. And it's why we don't have many municipal libraries. Most of them transition. Uh, to be a district library at some point in the past um, to uh, undock themselves from that politicization of the, the board itself. Uh, their funding traditionally comes from an appropriation from the municipality, uh, meaning it can be cut from year to year. You never know how much you're going to get, which is, I guess, exciting, uh, but not very uh, good practice for building a strong library. But just like the association libraries, municipal libraries can also use the municipal ballot option and the school district ballot option to get on the ballot and have the voters have their say of how much funding comes to that type of library. So very attractive option for municipal libraries as well as association libraries. Municipal libraries can do capital bonds through their municipality inherently. No special legislation is needed to make that happen. You do fall under civil service. You'll notice all of the public libraries fall under civil service. All the public Public libraries fall under the Freedom of Information Law. All of the public libraries fall under prevailing wage for uh, building work, uh, whether it be maintenance or construction. All of the public libraries fall under Wix Law for construction. Association libraries don't fall under any of those things. And you know, that can be a boon to them uh, in some ways. You can see the major trade-off comes when we talk about how libraries are funded uh, in the public library realm. When you move over to the district uh, types there, the last two, school district public library and special district public library, they have two major things in common. Their trustees are elected by the public and annually with no petition, they have the right to go to the residents of their service area for a budget increase. Uh, those are two very attractive things, which is why the district model is the recommended model by the New York State Board of Regents for the construct of libraries in New York State. So you'll see there was a huge movement in the 80s and 90s to transition libraries to the district model. It stabilized them, they're better funded. Taxation with representation goes a long way with taxpayers. Um, so this is the preferred model. You'll find these are the libraries in our system that are better funded, have more stability, and uh, possibly have grown their buildings too because they're able to do the bonding for that. So district model is, is recommended. You can transition from association or municipal to one of those districts. The difference, the main difference there between the two types uh, of districts, one, a school district public library, school district refers to the boundaries that the library serves. They match the boundary of a school district. The school district also serves as the taxing authority. They collect the taxes on behalf of the library and pass it on. But other than that, there's no administrative control by the school district of the library. The library is completely autonomous. A special district library would come into existence where there were multiple libraries in a school district, so a special district had to be carved out that was a geography that was smaller than a school district. This is normally done along town boundary lines, sometimes combining two municipalities, the Poughkeepsie Library District, for example. It encompasses both the town and city of Poughkeepsie. That's what makes up the library district service boundaries. But most special districts in our region, uh, and in Mid-Hudson, we have the most special districts of any library system system in the state uh, are usually around town boundaries. Uh, we have one uh, notable exception in Hyde Park and Statsburg where they divided up the town and Statsburg took the fire district uh, in the town of Hyde Park. So very interesting libraries. If you're a special district library, I, I highly encourage you as a trustee to get a hold of your special district legislation that formed your library. Uh, it will have critical information to understand uh, your service boundaries, your election process for your budget and trustee elections. That's an origin document you definitely want to get your hands on uh, as a new trustee. So that was a lot of information here in the first portion of our uh, session here this morning. So I'd like to pause to see if any questions have come through and I'm going to rely on Casey uh, to help me moderate these. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. That was great as always. Uh, we had a couple of people chime in with how long they've been at the library. We have Kat is joining us from the Rhinebeck Library. She's been there three months, so try not to scare Kat off, I guess, okay. while we're here today. We'll do. Um, we also have Alan is joining us from Amini, and he's got 25 plus years on the board. 
So I think he's got the most uh, years of anybody on the call, as far as we can tell. And Alan um, probably could give this workshop himself. He's got a lot of great experience. Uh, and for everyone who's on the call who doesn't know, just uh, Alan just uh, broke ground for a new library in Aminia with his peers on that board and Victoria, their director. So super exciting time for their library. All right. So yeah, so if anybody has any questions, they can um, pop them in the chat box and we'll work on them. Uh, we had a question about, are we going to talk about any grants for libraries today? And I guess maybe if we're not, where could you find info on that? Yeah, we're not going to dive into grants too much. It's definitely uh, an option for libraries and should be uh, pursued uh, as long as it aligns with the library's long-range plan of service. Uh, diversifying your funding is always good and can help you go further. Uh, but grants for libraries are far, few and far between, I would say. We've got a nice collection on our website. If you go to midhudson.org and click on Topics, look at the middle of that page for sustainable funding, you'll see a whole fundraising section in which we've collected uh, grant opportunities that are very common for libraries from uh, the American Library Association, the State Humanities uh, Department, uh, the State Library. At Mid-Hudson ourselves, we administer four grant programs, three mandated by the state, including the State Aid for Construction Program uh, and the Adult and Family Literacy Grant Program. So if you've got a specific need, if you've got a big project and you're looking for grant opportunities, definitely give us a call. We can let you know what grants have worked for other libraries. All right, we had a question um, about somebody uh, from somebody at the Marlboro Library and they were asking if they were a school district library and maybe we could tell people where they could find that kind of info or where it's best to find that info. Sure, yeah. A Marlboro Library is a school district library. Uh, and if you're not sure what type of library you are, your director can tell you in a heartbeat. They're very familiar with that. Uh, and also your charter information has that, in, that uh, very clearly laid out for you. All right, and we had a question from uh, Gisi uh, about uh, association libraries. And uh, did you say that the funding can't be cut by the town for an association library? That's only true if you've had a public vote. And Gisi, your library has had a public vote. Your board has used the municipal ballot option in the town of Shandaken. Uh, and you've had at least two successful votes, if I'm not mistaken, which means the town board is really out of the loop now. It's completely up to the voters uh, how much they vote to tax themselves for services. The town has no say over the level anymore. Okay. so. That was all I see for questions right now, but of course, if anybody has any other questions, please pop them in the question box or the chat box. I'm looking at both of them, and uh, we'll get to them when we have a break. Excellent. Thanks so much, Casey. You're welcome. Okay, so second portion, we're talking about roles and responsibilities of a library trustee, and this is probably the meat and potatoes of why you joined uh, the webinar this morning. Uh, and the, the first thing I just want to say as we kick off here is that um, in my 21 years of working with libraries, um, my, one of my absolute favorite things is working with library trustees. I just think it's so wonderful to watch people in our community step forward and give of themselves their time and energy and commitment to uh, such an important institution as the library and, and in their community. And it only works because we all work together. And I think that's one of the most important things to understand about your role and responsibility. While we're about to dive into what might seem like a long list of responsibilities, you're not doing it by yourself. You've got a professional library director who's got training and experience as there as your guide by your side. You have the full access to the staff of the Mid-Hudson Library System, which includes several uh, staff people with masters in library science and decades of experience. Uh, both myself and Casey have been in the profession a long time. Casey was even a former library director. Uh, we've seen a lot of stuff, uh, so we're here to help you. You'll also have other professionals like uh, a lawyer and a CPA who will help advise you. So just keep that in mind as we go through the responsibilities today. You're never expected to do it by yourself. Uh, if you feel overwhelmed, there's plenty of help, lots of examples of how to do things. You rarely have to start from scratch on stuff. So I just wanted to give that kind of disclaimer before we dive in here. So if you've got your packet and are following along here, I'm on page nine, which uh, starts out with a kind of a tongue-in-cheek library trustee job description, uh, which starts off with the whole idea of working as a team, that you're there as a collective authority, working with your other trustees and your director on a regular basis to make good decisions that result in quality library service for the people of your community. And it doesn't really get much simpler than that. That's exactly what we're doing there. And we're trying to do it uh, with a, a sensibility that really re 
results in good things. Uh, so you see there on page eight, uh, sorry, nine, a quote from a document from the State Board of Regents. And if you recall back to the top of the hour, we talked about the fact that the Board of Regents oversees libraries in New York State. So if we think about what that really means, that if there was a board that was completely off the rails and going against regulation and making very bad decisions or uh, you know, doing harm to the institution, the Board of Regents has the right to come in and remove a trustee or remove a whole board, and they have done that in the past. So reading their statement uh, on the governance role of a trustee probably is a good idea, so you understand what they're looking for and what their standards are. Uh, but this has always caught my eye in that document, that what they're really looking for are very basic things. They're looking for duty of care, that you act in good faith, that maybe you're not an expert in something, but you did your best, you did your due diligence on something, uh, that you have a duty of loyalty, that you, are, you have an allegiance to the library, that you're not using the library's platform to get something else done for another institution or to benefit your Self personally uh, and duty of obedience that you're going to fulfill the mission of that library you're going to actually uh, produce educational opportunities for the people of the community using the platform of the libraries building collection and staff assets that you have and that you're not going to try to siphon money off from the budget that was intended for those purposes to do something not related to the mission of the library um, like uh, I don't know, there's an unfortunate number of examples actually of, of what might happen of you know starting a side business or um, you know, overlapping with a, an agency that's already doing something and you're trying to replicate it at the library. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can kind of color outside the lines that are really frowned upon by the Board of Regents. So those three duties really, I think, encompass the intent behind how to do the work of a trustee, which is helpful to keep in mind. Uh, it's They're pretty broad, right? And they're not asking a whole lot. They're just asking you to be, you know, have good intent uh, as you do the work of being a library trustee. Now, in the Handbook for Library Trustees of New York, I find it very helpful, and not just because my name's on the cover, um, but we take each of the responsibilities for a trustee, and there's a cha whole chapter devoted to it, and we kept the chapter short and to the point, so they're digestible and accessible for the average trustee. Uh, and you see here the responsibilities uh, are not too surprising, I would imagine, right? That you're following the mission of the library, that you're helping to plan the future and evaluate if it's working, making sure you've got a great director in place. Place, making sure you've got adequate funding for the library, taking responsibility for that funding, policy making, facility stewardship. These are all things we're going to touch on in this portion uh, of the session. Are we going to take a, a deep, deep dive on each one? No, because it's only a 90 minute webinar. Um, but we are going to give you a fighting chance to understand the intent of each of these responsibilities and where you can go to find more information. But again, having that handbook for library trustees freely available online, you could jump and look at it right now, or getting that print copy, it's a great resource to have uh, during your time on the board. So we mentioned you've got a team here going on, and, and while Mid Hudson's not on this slide, this is the group that you're working with on a most frequent basis. Your director, and some of you have a friends group. About half the libraries in the system have a friends group as well. And the simplest way to think about kind of like the lanes, the lanes within which you work uh, in each of these roles, is that your director manages. Your director manages the day-to-day. -day. They take the budget and the policies that you pass, and they help use that to run the library. They spend the money in the categories that were authorized. They run the library as per the policies that the board has set. They are the public face of your organization. They manage the staff. They manage day-to-day -day interactions with patrons. And they also serve as your technical advisor. They are your library expert. They gather information from others in the system and from system staff to bring it back to you. And they really are your partner. And, and perhaps you might even think of them as your co-leader uh, on the library board to make good decisions on behalf of the library. You can definitely tell when, when boards and directors aren't making decisions hand in hand or a board is kind of doing their own thing and not respecting the expertise of their director. That really has to be done hand in hand and we're going to talk a little more about that next. But thinking about the lanes idea again of staying in your lane, the, gov the trustees are the governing board. You govern the organization. You set the plan, you set the budget, you set the policies, those are all governing documents uh, for the organization. And you're representing your neighbors while you're doing that work. So you're trying to just make good decisions based on what your community needs uh, using the assets that you have uh, at your fingertips. So your plan, 
would be setting goals for the library as an institution to produce programs and services that are responsive and relevant. You're passing a budget that aligns with that plan to make sure you're investing the financial resources of the library into the services and programs that will make a difference in the lives of those that you serve. And you're making policies that respect uh, both the, uh, I think, interactions that your patrons want to have with your institution, but as well as to protect the reputation of your institution. So we'll talk a bit about policies a little more here today. And if you have a friends group, uh, it can be wonderful. It can sometimes be horrible. It depends on the group of people that are there that year. Um, but for the most part, friends are there to support the library. They're there to be cheerleaders, to get the word out, to raise some extra money for special things. Um, but they really are, I think, ambassadors into the community, first and foremost. They are people that also strongly believe in the need for public libraries in our communities and work their themselves. They are volunteers themselves that help to do smaller fundraisers that help augment a special program at the library or help pay for a one-time expense. They're not a major source of revenue for most libraries, um, but they are a major source of goodwill for most libraries and building the reputation of the library and the community and providing another outlet for people to volunteer their time uh, at the institution. Perhaps at a less, um, I think, you know, the governance role, it's very serious. You're talking about the finances of the library and you're helping to make sure that the people uh, that work in your libraries are treated well. The friends group kind of joke around, they get to do the fun stuff, right? They get to run uh, smaller fundraisers and do outreach programs and uh, be the smiley face of the library, not that the board isn't as well. Uh, but friends do take uh, diplomacy. The trustees and the friends should have liaisons to each other's meetings to make sure there's good chain of communication uh, between those two groups. Uh, when that falls apart, some bad things can happen and your friends group can become unfriendly. Uh, and we've often been called in to help with those situations or help mediate those or get a memo of understanding in place uh, for those uh, those situations. So as a trustee, I would encourage you to financially become a member of your friends group. Make sure you're a paid member of the friends. Um, but best practice would not have you serve on both boards uh, if that was something of interest to you. It's not recommended uh, by the United for Libraries, which is the national organization that supports friends groups. So in your packet, you've got a, um, a little table that actually outlines the responsibilities of these three groups, and you can find that on page 11 in your packet. So it takes these three ideas of managing, governing, and supporting, and pulls it through policy making, planning, advocacy, meetings, etc. Uh, in case you've got a specific situation where you're not quite sure who does what, and I will say that the smaller your library, the blurrier the lines are. Uh, the larger the library, the more clear it is. The board can uh, comfortably just manage the, the governance end of things. But the smaller the library is, the more likely it is the board will have a hand in uh, maybe some facility issues or, or managing facilities facility issues or uh, maybe being a little more hands-on with, with fundraising if there's no friends group. So the, the life of a board member, it's not equal across all boards in the Mid-Hudson Library system. So uh, the person in the list uh, around you uh, here on the webinar today, they might have a very different experience than you do depending on the size of their library, the type of their library, the funding history for the library, how big their library board is, lots of variables there at play. So your relationship with your library director is just absolutely critical. It's so important because I think when that's going well, you'll have an awesome time on your library board. Uh, you'll have fun doing the work of the board. You'll uh, feel in partnership with the library director. You'll be doing great stuff together. Um, so respecting that relationship is really paramount in your work on the board. Uh, if you uh, come onto the board, there's already a director there, long history. You won't be involved in a hiring process. That can be a big relief when you have to do a hiring process. It can be a little nerve wracking because it's a big decision uh, to make for the history of your organization. Um, but having a director does mean you have to have clear communication and sometimes that means having things in writing. Uh, having perhaps a written contract that outlines the working conditions, the benefits, the salary, the evaluation process, uh, all very important. Uh, making sure you're very respectful of the difference between governance and management is really key. Um, you know when we think about the last slide where we talked about the, the director manages, the board governs. When you find yourself slipping into the role of micromanagement, maybe uh, you know directing the director to do X, Y, and Z, you know, 
take a beat and, and think that one through. Uh, because you as a trustee member, an individual trustee member, if you're not the board president, you really aren't imbued with much power on your own. You are what's called the collective authority. You have policy making and decision making authority when you're at the board table in an open meeting setting, uh, using Robert's rules to, to make decisions on behalf of the library. When you walk through the door of the library, you are certainly a VIP, a very important patron, um, but you don't have the right to come through the front door and start telling the director what to do. If you don't like a display or you think the children's rooms should be rearranged or you want to pick the paint color for a room, that's not really the level of work we need from trustees. We really need your energy focused on policy making and securing adequate funding and, and overseeing uh, the work of the board. That there's plenty to do, trust me, uh, to use your energy wisely at that level of the organization rather than uh, getting involved in the day to day. Now that doesn't mean that if you see something that you think is not going well or you think could be better, that doesn't mean you don't you bring that up, uh, but just do it in the right setting. Uh, perhaps bring it up to the chair of a committee that oversees that area, uh, bring it up to the board president who can then talk to the director about it. You really want to respect that chain of command. Uh, if we had every single trustee going to the director to tell them what to do or what they think, the director would spend almost all of their time managing a board communication. So funneling communication to the board president for the director in between meetings is often a good practice uh, with some very realistic exceptions when something just has to get done and, and you're the designee to get it done with the director. That's usually made pretty clear through your committee structure or at a meeting of how that will work. The other issue of chain of command we wanted to cover today is the relationship between uh, staff that are not the director and trustees. You as the board actually only supervise one staff person directly, which is the director, uh, which is why it's important to have expectations made clear, an evaluation process in play, and good communication. But the director manages the rest of the staff of the library. So if you're approached by a staff person directly who maybe is unhappy with something about their working conditions, maybe they don't, uh, they think the library is always too cold and can you please do something about that? Or I don't like the color of the new children's room or I'm unhappy about my hours. Can you talk to the director and do something about that? I'm here to tell you that you can gleefully say, no, I can't help with that. The director's the right person to go with it. You've hired your director to manage the staff and they take care of all that type of thing. There's two exceptions to this. If you were approached by a staff person who came to you in confidence and uh, expressed that they were concerned about some kind of financial problem, that you think that there might be something going on, uh, the bookkeeper seems to be very nefarious and seems to be pocketing money that they're supposed to be counting you would immediately take that extremely seriously. So financial whistleblower, immediately, that's totally fine for you to talk to a staff person and bring it to the attention of the appropriate committee on your board, possibly your executive committee. The second example is anytime there's some type of harassment that a staff person is reporting that's being perpetrated by the director. Obviously hard to you know, report that to the director as the staff person. So if they come to you and report staff uh, harassment, whether it be sexual harassment, some type of bullying, uh, whatever it might be, you, your radar should go, uh, go off, right? You should immediately take that to the right committee based on the policy of your board. Those are the two exceptions uh, to chain of command. But like I said, for most of the other stuff, be grateful that you get to say, oh, sorry, that's something the director has to help you with and give the director a heads up that the staff person approached you so they can manage that situation. We mentioned here annual evaluations, which have been brought up a couple times on this slide. And they are absolutely critical. And you might think to yourself, my director is wonderful. There's no need to evaluate them. We just give them a high five every time we see them. Uh, but the truth is it's really easy to institute evaluations while the, it's going well with your director. Uh, getting that annual process in place uh, creates an opportunity to thank the director for their work, encourage them to keep doing what they're doing, uh, give them that kind of official stamp of uh, approval and thanks for what they're doing. It also provides a framework for when things maybe aren't going so well. Uh, um, now, of course, you don't want to wait until an annual evaluation to address a major problem with your director. Your board president can have one-on-ones or the personnel committee can intervene if there's a significant problem that needs immediate intervention. Um, but the annual evaluation provides that written full board evaluation uh, if there's an issue that needs to be addressed and a construct for which to address it. Uh, a good, solid director is worth their weight in gold. You want to keep them. Uh, you want to do a good job of managing the communication with them. But if there is a problem, uh, you do 
you also need to handle that appropriately. And that's a sticky issue. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it does happen sometimes. And if you need help with that, we are here to assist with that. But one of the first questions we're going to ask you is, what are the past evaluations look like? And I can tell you in my 21 years of working here, every time I ask that question of a board president who calls me and tells me they're having trouble with their their uh, director, 100% of the time they tell me, oh, we don't do evaluations. Well, <laughs> that could be part of the problem, that there's not good communication, the director is not sure what they, they need to do or what's going on, and expectations have not been made clear. Um, so similar to probably a, an experience you may have had in your own uh, working life, uh, the importance of job descriptions that are up to date, clear expectations for the year, an annual evaluation process has been discussed with the director before it takes place, um, so they understand what it's going to look like. Those are all best practices uh, for working with your director. Hand in hand with this should be an evaluation of the board. If you're truly co-leading the library with the director, the board also needs to evaluate itself and be honest about how it's going. Are we working well together? Are board meetings well run? Do we have the education we need to do a good job here? Um, you can really save yourself a lot of heartache by doing that process. Uh, we worked with one library, a small library down in, in, in Dutchess County, and their uh, board evaluation process revealed that 75% of the trustees had no idea how to read the financial reports. They were getting at each monthly meeting. That's a pretty critical uh, finding, um, that they were not comfortable with reading those reports. And so we were able to do a little mini tutorial on it. The, the treasurer of the board did an orientation. Uh, it actually revealed that the, the the reports were not being done in a straightforward way that an average person really couldn't understand them. It wasn't necessarily the fault of, of the, the, tr the trustees. It was a chance to improve uh, something that was being done and, and really just had always been done that way. And it provided that open door uh, to find a new way to do something. So both sides of the equation, director and board need to have an annual evaluation process. On the Mid-Hudson website, which again is midhudson.org, there is a whole section devoted to trustee help uh, that's designed around the trustee handbook. So in the chapter uh, format, you'll then find links to examples of things that would be helpful, director and board evaluation samples, uh, as well as uh, other uh, tools that might be helpful to you in the different scenarios you find yourself in. So all the things we're going to talk about here today, uh, you know, we've talked about your responsibilities, your uh, working with the director. We're going to dive a little more into planning and policies here in, in a minute. But I just wanted to kind of give you this uh, maybe 30,000 foot view here, how all of these things work together, right? We're all trying to work together and all these different components, all the different responsibilities, the little micro things that you deal with at the board level, they all truly do add up to tell a story about your organization. And at the end of the day, we want to produce uh, an organization that is making a difference in people's lives uh, and inspires them to invest in it in the future, whether that's an investment of dollars by voting yes or donating to the library, an investment of goodwill towards an institution that's very important in the community. All of these things help to contribute to that. So when you look at a library that you feel is more successful than yours and you wonder, you know, what's that key thing that's different over there, it might not just be one thing. It might be a whole host of things that have come together to create a really strong library that people are excited to invest in for the future. So a lot of the stuff we talk about today are related to the things you see here. Uh, we already touched on community-based planning. We're going to talk about that more but there's a definite evolution here that when you're you have solid and transparent governance and you're basing decisions using community input it's resulting in quality service it means more people want to work with you and you find more opportunities to connect in the community it means it's easier and easier to get the word out about what you're doing and more people know and respect what you do and that's where you see adequate funding come through whether it be from that public vote which makes up the bulk of your funding or a grantor that's excited to invest in your your organization it all all works together to have that outcome. So if you start at the opposite end here and you just think to yourself, we need money, and you go after it without analyzing how you're doing in these other areas, uh, you might find yourself just treading water for a very long time. You need to do that kind of, you know, full analysis of where do we need to do some work here from the governance standpoint? Are we as transparent as we could be? Uh, are our policies up to snuff? Do we treat our staff well? Are we investing money in the right spots? And let's have a real plan as we move forward here to seek uh, additional funding if that's what you find your library needs the most. 
so this planning process is, is what I was just kind of leading up to here, which is this idea that you have to have a plan, right? You have to understand where you're trying to lead the library to. What are we all doing here? Is it just the same old, same old? Or are we going to adjust and course correct? I was talking to a director on Friday evening who's faced with a, their next planning cycle, and they'd been well on their way before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, they had to really stop and think should we be using community input we got before COVID to make decisions about the next two years? Or do we need to adjust our thinking a little bit uh, to respond to the new reality that our, our families and our, individually, our individual residents are now faced with? Uh, we certainly didn't have a, as much issue around uh, digital inclusion until we saw our students being forced to do remote learning unprepared, perhaps technologically. Uh, that would mean perhaps a shift in thinking about what library services look like over the next 24 months. So, a traditional planning process, you can just shorten the cycle and use it for the next two years. Or if you're faced with needing a brand new plan of service uh, that is uh, maybe longer term, this process works as well. It's, it's very scalable. This is taken from the trustee handbook. You'll find it in the appendix. Uh, it's uh, talked about more obviously in depth than I'm going to do here today. These are the basic five steps of doing a long range plan or strategic plan for your library um, to make sure that everyone on your board has been heard about their personal vision of where they think the library is going, uh, testing that with some assessment work of uh, data about your library's performance, whether it be program attendance, uh, collection development, what's popular in your community, what patrons ask for that you haven't been able to give them, uh, doing a real analysis of usage of your current services, and then stop looking inside and start looking outside and get out there and talk to your community about what their aspirations for the future are. Uh, we have a program at Mid Hudson called Turning Outward, which Casey runs, which uses a national planning model to help you gather intel from your community about what's really important to them. And this is not the old school way of going out there and asking someone, you know, just point blank, what should the library do for you? Because uh, the, the truth is they don't really know. They just tell you a bunch of stuff they think you want to hear. But if you ask them what they're actually experts in, which is, what are your hopes for the future? What are your aspirations for our community? What are your hopes for your family or your, your kids? And you start to hear them vision their future. You can bring that information back to the board table and along with your professional library staff, start to design a plan, programs, services, partnerships that truly speak to the needs of your community. And so using that kind of information is, it's exciting. It's also a lot of work. Um, so you need to have a devoted uh, committee of your board to do that work to combine uh, with the efforts of your library director. Uh, we have a formal program here at Mid Hudson that helps you do that. If you want to do it yourself, you can totally do it yourself too. You don't have to wait for us. Um, so if that's something your board's facing, I would say don't hesitate to reach out and we can let you know how other libraries have done that. Um, but this is absolutely critical to being an effective library and it will make your time on the board far easier. When you have a plan that you understand and you know why we're doing the things we're doing, it makes a lot of other decisions just much easier. You understand uh, why the budget looks the way it does. You understand why a policy might be the way it is. Uh, you might understand why you need the friend's help to raise a little more money to accomplish something special in the plan. It just makes everything kind of come together and coalesce. Uh, it's a, a very, very important document uh, for you and your service on the board. These are some of the questions uh, that Casey uses in the Turning Outward program. This is from a program from the American Library Association that we've customized for libraries in our system. Uh, libraries in our system tend to run on the, the medium to smaller side, uh, and we wanted to make this program less overwhelming for smaller library boards. Uh, but we do use some key tools from this Libraries Transforming Communities program from the American Library Association. And you can see these are just basic questions to have a conversation with people or a group of people in your community to find out what change they, th they think needs to happen in their community and what their hopes are for the future. So your library can be a partner in making that vision uh, come to life. So this definitely relates to your, your next responsibility there of securing adequate funding, because if you're going to go out and ask taxpayers for more money or go to a major donor or a grant maker for funding for the library, you have to have a clear vision for what that money is going to produce on the behalf of the community. So the first thing I want to say to you here is that your library is not a charity. Uh, your stable, secure tax money that comes in through that library vote should be enough to cover the mission critical items to keep your library open, open, 
keep the facility in good shape, keep your library workers well paid so that you're not having a revolving door of people leaving all the time, um, and that you're actually providing basic library services without wondering where you're going to get the next penny to make that happen. Uh, if you're not feeling that way in your library, that's definitely a place to put energy, uh, is to increasing the amount of funds coming into the library. We could definitely help you with that. We have a long track record of helping libraries win votes. Uh, we have a 92% success rate in the Mid-Hudson Library System, uh, which is pretty, I'm going to say, impressive. Uh, it means our libraries are very well thought of in the community, and it means if you make a reasonable ask, uh, most likely taxpayers will vote yes on behalf of your library. Uh, so when we talked about before your different ways to go to the public to ask for funding, again, the district libraries, they have an automatic mechanism, no problem. The association libraries in municipal libraries, it's not as easy. Uh, most of you are pursuing a municipal ballot option, uh, that 414 vote, and there is an entire 414 manual available to you uh, that was just updated this year. And it's a process you have to start early. Uh, you cannot make that decision to go for that vote any later than I would say April. And I think given the complications of COVID, if you want to do it, you should make that decision even earlier next year. Uh, the vote does have to take place on the date of the general election in November. And so getting together a strong timeline to hit all the bureaucratic steps, as well as the campaign best practices, you want to give yourself a long lead time for that. So your board should discuss that annually about whether or not you're going to go. And I would strongly recommend you do not go more than four or five years without a vote. Uh, it would be far better if you could get into a pattern of going every two to three years with a 414 vote so you can keep the amount you're asking for at a reasonable level. Uh, when you wait eight to ten years between votes, there's no way you're going to be able to go out again and ask for anything less than a double-digit increase, and most taxpayers are really going to balk at that. They're not going to understand that you haven't come back to them in a long time. Uh, they're not going to appreciate that you haven't come back in a long time. All they're going to know is that you're asking for a very big jump all at once. So smaller incremental jumps on a regular basis are far more palatable to taxpayers uh, than big decade, once a decade jumps are. Uh, that's been our experience. It's much easier to sell the smaller jumps. Uh, you almost in a way are kind of training your, your voters to get used to voting. Um, and so that, that it really follows the model of the districts who have the routine votes that people are used to. Um, they're not asking for a ton of, of an increase each time. It's more relatable to the average voter. Um, so for 414 libraries, I, I literally beg of you uh, to think about that pattern of every two to three years doing that 414 vote. It's hard to start that pattern, but once you do, you'll see libraries like the Patterson Library, the Kinderhook Library, who have gotten into that pattern. Um, they're very grateful for having done so. And, and you're, the, both of those board presidents are happy to talk to you and explain what they do, how they do it, uh, and how they got their board on board with that idea. So another big part of financial planning is making sure you've got a solid facility plan. Uh, right after your, your library staff, the library facility is your greatest asset, and it's an expensive asset to keep up and to plan for the future for. And especially in the Hudson Valley, we have an awful lot of libraries and buildings that were not designed to be libraries, uh, which means a lot of historic buildings sometimes the, buildings that used to be homes, uh, buildings that might not have the proper electrical system for what we, we need in a modern library, uh, libraries that aren't fully accessible to people with disabilities. We have a whole host of issues. And so having a really good sense of the building, of the uh, age of the building, the age of uh, major systems of the building that can help you project uh, how much money you'll need in the future to keep up the building, the sooner you have information like that to base financial decisions on, the better. Uh, and you can uh, access this very simple outline. To car if you don't have a facility plan, this is the perfect place to start. Uh, we have it as a Word document um, at Hudson.org to help you kind of fill in the blanks. Uh, your facility committee can use it. To to gather information about the building and, and just get a rough sketch of what's coming in the future and, and do some um, rough estimations of the types of uh, projects and the level of funding you're going to need to make things happen. So you can strategize about where that money is going to come from. And uh, capital financing and, and where money comes from, we can definitely tell you a, a host of stories of how libraries make that all work. Uh, but you should have a, a capital fund that money's being saved in every year um, for those planned expenses, just like in your own home. You know the roof is going to have to be replaced sometime. Same thing at the library, uh, just on a larger scale financially. So uh, this should be a document that is part of a planning process, if not part of your strategic planning process, but something that's visited annually to update to make sure that uh, people are aware of what's coming. 
this fiduciary responsibility, this is the one, you know, my dad was actually a library board president at the Pleasant Valley Library for about a decade. And this was the thing that he spent his most time thinking about was making sure that he and his peers on the board did a good job overseeing the money that was entrusted to them as the trustees of their library. He took uh, very, uh, this very seriously. Uh, he always pointed out that trustees are called trustees because the word trust is in there. People are trusting you with their library and with the assets they're investing in their library. And so making sure you've got good oversight procedures in place from internal financial controls to third-party audits to monthly discussions about your financial reports, that has to be something every trustee takes responsibility for, not just the treasurer, or the bookkeeper, or the finance committee, but everyone should have a hand in those discussions. And so just like that story I told about the library whose trustees were strong enough to admit they didn't understand the financial reports, if that's you, there is no shame in raising your hand and going, can you please explain this? Or could I get some time with the treasurer to understand this report a little better? I want to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. That is every trustee's responsibility. Uh, and if you think to yourself, I'm not good at math or I'm not a CPA, how am I supposed to understand this? There's very simple things to look for. You know, are you overspent in categories, uh, asking for a year? Year to date percent uh, expended uh, column to see uh, is funding being spent at a reasonable pace on a particular line. For example, if you were in uh, June getting your June uh, financial report and you saw the personnel line was 90% expended, that would be a huge red flag, right? Because how are you going to get through the rest of the year paying your staff? Or you might see in the program line, the, the children's programming line, that in June 90% of the funds were spent, and that's explainable, that's understandable, because most of that money does get spent in the earlier part of the year to prepare for the summer reading program, which is the largest children's program in most libraries. So getting familiar with the line items, making sure you understand the pace that things are spent at. Um, again, not just the treasurer's job, but that's everyone's job. We're going to talk about internal financial controls a little bit here in this policy making section because a lot about policy making is really about risk management. Uh, it's uh, my former boss, uh, Josh Cohen, used to joke that the most pessimistic people on your board should be on the policy committee. Uh, those are the people who think about the worst case scenario. Uh, what if this happened? Or how would we handle this if this happened? And sometimes it means thinking the worst of people, uh, which is very uncomfortable. But thinking through the worst things that can happen result in strong policies and procedures that help to protect the library. Uh, they also uh, help to provide external facing policies that help your staff uh, know what to do in certain situations and help provide consistent service to people uh, without judgment, which is very important in a public library setting. But it's absolutely critical that policies be in writing and board approved. Otherwise, they're not truly policies of the library board. Um, so making sure you've got dates at the bottom of your policy, the last time they were looked at by the board, whether it be approved or reviewed, those dates should be captured uh, on your policies, and that's going to be part of the new minimum standards, which require that you review policies uh, at, uh, at least every five years. Um, and so you'll want to stagger that so you're not overwhelmed with looking at all policies every five years. Um, but if you haven't started tracking the dates on policies, that's a project to get on uh, to make everyone's life better. So you'll see in the uh, trustee handbook and on the state library's website and on the Mid-Hudson website, this recommended policy checklist. And this ties back to the minimum standard of which policies that you, you should have and please note that some of these policies you must have, that law requires you to have. So what we've done here to try to make it uh, more digestible is broken it into two categories. Those policies that we call externally facing, those are policies that uh, help to govern the uh, intersection of the public's interaction with your library, whether it be the collection or getting a library card or using the meeting space at your library. These are all kind of like the public facing policies. And then the internal policies, if you think of like a restaurant, it's like the back of house. Uh, it's the back of house policies that help everything uh, run smoothly from the financial personnel and planning side of things. So a uh, first thing I'll say to you is that don't freak out if your library doesn't have all of these. Only two libraries in the whole system have all of them. And there's like a new one added every year so it feels like it's like a Sisyphean challenge you can never quite keep up with it um, and it's frustrating to us at Mid-Hudson too because laws change constantly new things are introduced uh, last year they introduced sexual harassment prevention policies this year they're introducing a required pandemic response plan uh, it changes pretty frequently so uh, it, there's always something to do in this area if you're looking for uh, something to really sink your teeth into 
But we'll just point out a few things, and this is uh, something we take a much deeper dive in in our other workshop about core values. Uh, we lovingly call that one also, aka Policies 101. We take a much deeper dive into the policy end of things in that webinar, and we've got one of those coming up soon. I'll, I have the date for you in one of the slides here. Um, just taking a look at the external policy list there, there's a few here that are uh, you know, required uh, by law. If your building's not fully accessible to people with disabilities, not fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, you must have a policy that addresses how you provide uh, services equally to everyone of all abilities. Uh, when you take a look at the internal side of things, on the board section, the conflict of interest policy is required by law. You must sign a disclosure statement every year as a trustee related to the conflict of interest policy policy. Um, let's see, the freedom of information, the public access to records, that's also governed by law. Uh, I'm pointing out your financial control section here because in my mind this is one of the most important areas right after your personnel policies. Um, the list that you see here lines up with the best practices that are put out by the Office of the State Comptroller and for the public libraries on the call that's really important uh, because the Office of the State Comptroller has the right to come and audit your library at any time and they judge you against these financial control areas. So there's an awesome document on the Office of the State Comptroller's website um, that walks you through all of this stuff. We have sample policies on the Mid-Hudson website for almost all of these things. And if you don't find what you want, just reach out to us uh, and we'll help you find what you need. You never have to start from scratch with policy making. If you find that you don't have a lot of policies, we can help you prioritize them to work on the ones that mitigate risk uh, the best. Um, so again, lots of support for you here in this area, but extremely important area of library work. Um, this is the, the work that helps to protect the library from litigation. That's one of the most important things. Uh, it helps to make sure people are treated fairly. Uh, it helps to head off uh, bigger problems that could be cons uh, considerably time consuming if not addressed through policy, particularly in the area of personnel and finance. Um, so I think this is an area that I, I think more libraries probably need to spend time thinking about. Um, and we do a project every year called the Essential Documents Policy Inventory. I just said that wrong. Essential Documents uh, Inventory Project, where we keep track of what you have. And we do that because oftentimes when a director comes in as new, or you have a huge turnover in the board, there's some institutional knowledge that's lost, and then we've got a record of, of what you've got. It's also very helpful when we're consulting with your library and we get questions from you, oh, how do we handle X, Y, or Z? Well, having your policy to refer to is one of the origin documents we'll use to help you diagnose things. So. If you're a really pessimistic person, there's a, a big clue for you to volunteer for the policy committee. So this is the, the webinar I just mentioned, the Core Values and Ethics, also known as Policies 101. That's coming up on uh, Wednesday evening on October 21st. Um, so you have time to get to that one if you're interested in that. We'll take a deeper dive on that policy list that you just saw on the last slide. So one of the last responsibilities we're going to talk about before we explain uh, board meetings is this idea of the library trustee as ambassador and advocate, um, that you yourself are really already a super advocate because you believed in the library enough to come and volunteer your time there. Uh, and so I, I call this responsibility the if not you, then who responsibility, because if you yourself aren't willing to speak up on behalf of the library, there's not too many other people who are going to. Um, so making sure that's a, a proactive activity of the library board is really important uh, to get the word out about what the library has to offer and why it's important. We often forget that people don't live and breathe libraries like we do, and they might not understand why we do some of the things we do. So making sure we talk in value-based language um, sometimes it's far more important than telling people the specifics of what we have to offer because people who understand why libraries are important, um, they're the ones who become the best advocates for libraries and, and really help make libraries better, I think, um, by explaining why libraries are so important. So making sure you work your networks, you know, who do you know in the community who are opinion leaders, whether they be formal or informal opinion leaders, from, you know, a town supervisor to someone who's just re really well respected in the community that a lot of people go to to find out what's going on in town. You want them to have good opinion of the library, to have information about what's going on before rumors get started in the community. So Casey does a whole class called Advocates and Ambassadors uh, to help with this issue. If you're interested in that, uh, watch the, the 2021 calendar for more information about the Advocates and Ambassadors training, uh, if that's something you'd like to brush up your skills on. 
But I think at the end of the day, we want to you know tell stories about our library. That's the most impactful way uh, to help people understand why libraries are so important in people's lives. When you're able to tell that story about someone that the staff helped to find a job, uh, or a family that's been supported through the library during COVID uh, with help with remote learning, uh, or uh, you know maybe someone who came in as a hobbyist who came in to do genealogy research, who reconnected uh, with a branch of their family thanks to the research work of your library staff. These are all very human stories that people can relate to, which really drives home uh, what libraries can mean uh, in a civil society, which is a really critical aspect of the future, I think, of our society moving forward. So we have to be storytellers. We have to get out there and make sure the right people are hearing stories about us. So when they have the chance to influence the future, whether it be the financial future or the reputational future of our libraries, they know good things about us. And we can't, we can't assume they understand what we're doing and why we do it. We've got to be proactive about that. So Casey, I'm going to pause here to see if any questions have cropped up. All right. So we had a question um, about the staying in your lane. And so we had a question about, is it overstepping to provide a director with a list of ideas to get the community more involved, like scavenger hunts with local businesses or games to play with kids to get them more acquainted with the library? I think it depends. It depends if there's a strategic initiative um, related to, we. if we all agree, we need to get the word out. Okay, there's a committee that works on that. We brainstorm ideas. We decide which ones are the most important and the director then knows uh, what to do. Uh, I think if you come in with a list of ideas, it's not that they're not appreciated, but the director then might feel obligated to follow through on them all, which could take up a huge amount of time and maybe wasn't the strategic priority of the organization. So I think using the committee structure to brainstorm ideas and as a group, prioritize what's going to get worked on is important, um, but also making sure if you did have good ideas and they got passed through to not take it personally, if not all of them come to life, uh, the director uh, is usually doing the job of, of usually two or three people uh, and they're not able to get to every um, great idea that, that comes their way. Um, so those strategic priorities are really important. So even if you don't have an, a long range plan that's up to date, at least having an annual plan of what our goals are to achieve this year, um, that that's really important. So we do put energy in the right places. Okay, great. Um, that was it for the questions that we had that are still open. Ooh, you guys are taking it easy on me today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so board meetings, uh, super exciting, I know, right? Um, but you know, everyone likes to go to a good meeting, right? No one likes to go into a boring meeting or a meeting that's poorly run or a meeting that feels like a waste of time. You wanna make sure your time is being used wisely. So I just wanted to kind of give you the rules of engagement here for board meetings, which are somewhat uh, defined by open meetings law here in New York, that's a state law. So open meetings law applies to all types of libraries, including association libraries. There's a component of education law that requires association libraries to also follow open meetings law, which is, is found in public officers law, which you might not realize, um, which is why they had to make that special dispensation for association libraries. It also applies to public libraries committee meetings, not association library committee meetings, but municipal school district public libraries and special district public libraries committees also under open meetings law. The law requires you to advertise the meeting to the public so that you're required to send it to the newspaper. You don't have to pay for a legal notice though, but you'll want to prove that you sent a notice about your meetings to the newspaper. You'll need to declare a newspaper of record annually so it's clear where people could find out about the meeting. It should be obviously on your library's website and posted in your library's facility. All meetings must be accessible to the public. That means both in terms of, and this is, you know, I, I just realized I'm talking about pre-COVID, right, before we have the executive orders that adjust to allow for online meetings, um, but these still applies here, that they have to be accessible to the public. So um, in normal, let's say the before times, before COVID, accessible meant in a physical location that's accessible to people of all abilities, as well as accessible to the number of people who want to come and watch the board do the business of the library. Um, so accessibility has both of those definitions. In COVID times, we now have uh, an adjustment to open meetings law that allows for fully online meetings, which are normally not allowed. Uh, they normally have to be held in person. And the public still has the right to come to your online meeting. So you do need to advertise how someone can attend an online meeting. Uh, and any document that's going to be discussed during the meeting has to be made available to the public so they can follow along with the discussion of the document. 
And if you're the secretary, just a high sign here, draft minutes must be produced within two weeks of the meetings. It's a draft, right? They don't get approved until the next board meeting, but that draft has to be done within two weeks and the public has the right to ask to see that draft uh, of the minutes. Now, there's also something called executive session that allows for the board to have a confidential conversation. But the reasons that you can use executive session are defined by law. It's not just any time you're gonna have a conversation that seems uncomfortable or that you wish you didn't have to have in front of a staff person. Uh, it's only for uh, very few reasons, only eight reasons actually. Uh, and they're defined by law. They're all listed in the handbook, but I'll tell you really, it's only these four that normally come up. And the, the primary one is actually the last one there that's left that's listed uh, the medical financial credit or employment history of a particular person so for a personnel issue or a problematic uh, person that the board is dealing with whether it be a, another board member or even a patron um, that could be a reason to protect the reputation of that person if you were negotiating a real estate deal if you were uh, uh, under legal litigation those would be reasons to uh, have a confidential conversation at the board level but if you're talking about something that makes you um, squeamish, maybe it's about salaries of the staff, it's not an automatic that that's a, a reason to go into executive session. So be very careful and judicious in your use of executive session. Uh, anytime you use it, it immediately spurs a suspicion amongst your director, staff, uh, and the public. So be very careful about using it. When you do use it, I'm gonna say 99% of the time, your director should be in executive session with you, um, unless the issue is them, and then obviously you would not invite them into executive session with you, um, but you can invite whomever you want into executive session with you. Like I said, 99% of the time, your director comes with you. Um, you could invite Casey or I in as a technical advisor, your lawyer, your CPA, if you needed them, um, to get advice in a confidential setting. You do have to take minutes of an executive session only though, if you've made a decision in executive session. So if no vote is held, no minutes need to be kept. Uh, and if you did make a, a vote, do a vote in executive session, those minutes need to be available one week after the meeting to be incorporated into your full minutes. So as you can see, that would only mean one week of confidentiality before you revealed the results of what happened in the executive session, which is a bit nonsensical. So again, careful and strategic use of executive session is my uh, advice to you. The public has the right to attend your meetings, but the law does not provide the right for them to speak at your meetings. So you should have written procedures for public comment. Uh, if you ever have a controversial issue or you're a trustee at the Woodstock Library, you'll be grateful you have written procedures for public comment uh, to manage that section. And just a word to the wise to not let the public hijack your meetings. Uh, the meetings are there to do the business of the library. And while they may have concerns they want to bring to your attention, that's not the primary purpose of a board meeting. And so don't be afraid to move along uh, and to not you know, dive into an issue that someone just randomly brought to your attention during that meeting. Uh, your board president should be managing uh, that section of the meeting uh, very tightly. We've got some best practices here for you to wrap things up. Uh, we hope you're receiving your board packet about a week in advance to give you time to prepare. Uh, feel free to ask questions about what you read there in advance of the meeting to save time or to identify a problem before a meeting. Uh, we do not advise that you introduce new business at the meeting itself. That gives no time for preparation or research to be done and, and often creates a lot of uh, chaos in a meeting. So recommend new business to your board president to be introduced at a future meeting. And if you're not familiar with Robert's Rules of Order, I suggest you Google or use your uh, search engine of choice, uh, uh, Robert's Rules of Order Cheat Sheet, uh, so you understand how to make a motion and to second a motion and, and make sure you've got legal votes happening at your meetings. And my last piece of advice to you is to always behave as if the press is in the room and reporting on your board meeting. Uh, and so to just be you know, to the point, get the business done, uh, let's save a lot of the social back and forth for before and after your meeting, um, but always assume that that meeting could be reported on at the newspaper and make sure that you want to be proud of how uh, your board is running. So we've got more time for questions if anyone wants to hang on the line, but I also want to respect the fact that our stated end time is 1130. Um, so I'm going to 
stay on the line a little longer. But I, for those of you who have to go right away, I just want to have one more thing that I say to you, which is a big old thank you. Uh, because I think that American public libraries only work because of people like you. And we are a unique institution that is one of the most shiny examples of what a life should look like in our society. That people work together to do good uh, for our neighbors. And it only works because good people like you step up to do the governance work of this institution. And so Casey and I just want to say thank you so much for your work, uh, for your time and attention here today to learn more about uh, being on the library board. And we hope you understand that we're here to help support you. Uh, never hesitate to reach out uh, with questions or uh, thoughts that you have. Uh, we really enjoy speaking with you. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, and Casey, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to stay on the line to answer them. All right, so we're getting some thank yous rolling in, and uh, we did have another question about uh, where to find more info on the Turning Outward program, and I didn't share uh, the link in the question box, if anybody needs it there, to our Turning Outward page on our website, which also includes some of the resources from the American Library Association to help with having community conversations and getting started with Turning Outward. Great. And uh, yeah, right now, mostly folks saying thanks. Um, we have... Uh, Don from Asopus is looking for a notice of completion uh, about the webinar here today and how we could receive one of those. I think we could just email, email uh, Don something like that, right? Yeah, we can do something like that. There will be a follow-up email that everybody who registered for the webinar will get. Uh, and it'll include the recording that we have here today, some of the slides, and uh, some of the resources that we talked about. So we have a question about if there will be a certificate of completion um, for coming to the webinar today. Yeah, we don't normally issue those, but if your board requires you to prove you came, we're happy to help you get the documentation that you need. You can uh, email Casey for that and we'll get you something that would help you. So I'm super impressed if we've gotten through all the questions already. That's got to be our first. Yeah, that's um, that's all we have right now. It's still a lot of thank yous from folks, but um, yes, yeah, no other no other questions right now. All right, great. Well, for anyone who's still on the line, we'll get you a PDF of the slide deck here. And we, we're going to send you a link to an evaluation form. We always appreciate your feedback on our sessions so we can make them better for the next crew uh, that comes through. So thanks again for your time. And we wish you the best of luck uh, on your time on your library board. And we look forward to speaking with you in the future.